from knowing them. You've made a difference in my life, for this I am grateful. I would like to thank everyone for your prayers, visits, phone calls, cards, and well wishes. You are all like family to me. Love you, Paul Lawson. Where's your hat, Paul? <laughs> Went up to see Paul before he had his surgery, and of course they, had, they come out and they put that little surgical hat on him. He looks so cute, I said, you ought to wear it to church. I walked into church building this morning, and there was Paul <laughs> with his hat on. You're welcome, Paul. Another card to read. On behalf of the family of Clarence Hayes, David and I wish to express our thanks to our brothers and sisters here at the Betsy Lane Church of Christ during the illness and passing of Clarence. Thank you for all the cars, calls, cards, visits, flowers, and especially for all your prayers. Thank you to the wonderful sisters here at the church who gave their time to prepare a dinner for the family after the funeral. We would like to thank Bob and Margaret who visited, had prayer, called, and brought food. Thank you, Tommy and Thelma, for everything you did. Thank you to Sally, who always thought of Joyce Marie and made sure that she had dinner every day. She really appreciated it so much. Last but not least, we would like to thank Lisa, who helped take care of Daddy Hayes during his final days. We are so blessed to have such a wonderful congregation here at the Betsy Lane Church of Christ. We love each and every one of you. And we love you too. The Bible, the precious Word of God, 66 separate books written by at least 40 different men, all led by the Holy Spirit, and all of them writing of the Messiah, the Son of God, some of them saying that He's going to be sacrificed for mankind, those who wrote in the Old Testament, and some of them saying he has been sacrificed for mankind, those who wrote in the new. That the Bible is authentic cannot be denied. Although written by many people, many different people, yet there cannot be found one contradiction or scientific error in that wonderful book. You know, as we look through the Bible, we definitely see the individuality of the different writers being expressed in their writings. For example, the Apostle Paul, a man extremely intelligent, a doctor of the Old Testament law. And in many of his writings, we find it difficult even for us today to understand some of the things that he's saying. He speaks and writes so deeply. The Apostle Peter talked about the writings of Paul and said some of which are hard to understand. Luke was a writer of the, Old, of, of the New Testament and some of Luke's writings contain words that are used by, were used by doctors. Oh, that's right. Luke was a physician. So you see the individuality of the writers coming out in each one of their writings. John, on the other hand, wrote, wrote in very simple terms. Easy for even us, to under, us uneducated folks to understand his writings. John was a fisherman. He talked like the common people. He was easier to understand. Let's look at four Gospels. Matthew was a tax collector. In his writings, Matthew was attempting to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. In the first chapter of his book, in fact, we read in verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham. Now, Matthew is writing to the Jews. And so it is that he's starting with Abraham, who was the father of the 
Jewish nation continues with his genealogical tree and ends up in verse 16 saying that Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So Matthew, in his attempt to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, begins with Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, and goes right on through his genealogy and ends up with Jesus. Luke, on the other hand, that physician, he specifically wrote to the Gentiles. It was his job to prove to all of the non-Jews that Jesus was and is the Christ, the Son of God. As a part of the proof that Luke is going to use, he's going to use the genealogy of Jesus also. But he's going to use it in a different way than Matthew did. Matthew began with Abraham and ended with Jesus. Luke, on the other hand, begins at Jesus and goes backwards. He says in Luke 3.23, And Jesus himself to be, began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Then Luke takes the genealogy of Jesus backwards all the way to Adam in the Garden of Eden. And he concludes his genealogy in Luke 3.38, where he says, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. You know, the Gentiles may not have had a great deal of knowledge about Abraham, but they would have known about Adam. And so it is that Luke tries to prove that Jesus is the Son of God by going through the genealogy of Jesus, beginning with Jesus and going back to the man that the Gentiles would understand, Adam, the first man. John writes to a very distinct group of people. The ones who disbelieved that any person could, could live on earth and not sin. They disbelieved that Jesus Christ physically came to the earth and gave himself upon the cross. We were studying from our class this morning. Philippians chapter 2 tells us so plainly that Jesus gave up his spot in heaven with the Father and came down and took upon himself the form of a man, a servant. Being found in fashion as a man, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Well, John does it this way. John says this. Uh, John was writing to those who did not believe that Jesus could do that. They were known as the Gnostics, and the word Gnostics is the Greek word, which means the knowing ones. Yeah. We'd call them the unknowing ones, but they proclaim themselves to be the knowing ones. John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then in verse 14, John tells exactly who it is that he's speaking about. For he says that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus. Started out in heaven, ended up on earth, lived the perfect life. Remember the Gnostics, one of the things that the Gnostics believed was that anything physical had to be evil and sin. And so John writes and tells them, Jesus started out spiritual, but he ended up physical, but he didn't sin. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 4.15, For we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So John writes to a specific group of people. He writes to those who did not believe that Jesus could come down and become a physical man and yet live above sin. Finally, we look at the Gospel of Mark. Mark's Gospel is different. The other Gospel writers talk a whole lot about the parables of Jesus. 
sower went out to sow. The woman lost a coin, swept her house out from one end to the other. Jesus liked to teach by parables. The parable was the easiest way for the common man to understand the lesson that Jesus was trying to get across. Now, we know that a parable is a spiritual, a physical story, but it's got a spiritual application. You know, it's like when you're growing up and you read Aesop's fables. Aesop's fables, the dog had a ham in his mouth and he was walking along the pond and he looks down and he sees in the water, here's an image of another dog and it's got a ham in its mouth. And so the dog decides, well, I'd, I'd, I'd like this ham I got in my mouth, but I'd like to have that one too. So he opens his mouth to grab that other ham and the ham falls out of his mouth into the water and it's lost. Well, it's a physical story, but there's a... <coughs> There's an application there of morality. Aesop was a moral writer. The Gospel of Mark. Mark doesn't talk much about Jesus and his parables. Mark, on the other hand, is writing to a very specific group of people. Rather than spend a great deal of time... Come back here. Rather than spend a great deal of time in talking about the parables of Jesus, Mark talks about the action of Jesus. Mark was writing to the Romans. Anybody who knows anything about the Romans realizes that the Romans understood power. And the Romans understood might. The Romans had taken over the then known world all the way up to England, down into North Africa, and all the way over to Asia. They had taken over the then known world. And they had taken over the world through absolute power and might. The Roman government would enter into an area and they would give the people of the region one of two choices. You can either voluntarily become a part of the Roman government and we will make you Roman citizens. If you refuse to become a part of our government, we're going to take you over anyway. And you know what? There was no third choice given. You've got one of two choices, but either way, you're going to become a part of our government. And that's how Rome understood. They understood power, they understood authority, and they understood might. So Mark writes to the Romans. And when Mark writes to the Romans, he describes the Son of God, Jesus, in His power and in His might and in His authority. Let's look at some of the ways that Mark writes about the lordship, the power, the might, and the authority of Jesus this morning. Number one, Mark tells the Romans that Jesus was Lord over demons. We know that during the times when Jesus lived that there were people who were possessed with demons. Demons that could cause multiple problems. Some of the demons that possessed individuals caused those individuals to become self-destructive. In Matthew chapter 17, we read about a man who had a son who was demon-possessed, and this son would often cast himself into the water, or he would cast himself into the fire in order to attempt to destroy the son. Jesus cast the demon from this boy. In Acts chapter 8, we read of Philip, one of the seven who was chosen to be deacons in Acts Chapter 6, Philip is also referred to as Philip the Evangelist. He was a preacher. The apostles had laid their hands upon him previously and thereby had imparted unto him certain miraculous gifts. And one of the gifts that they had imparted upon Philip was the ability to cast out demons. Read with me in Acts chapter 8, verse 7. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed 
with them. You know, the ability that people like Philip had to cast out demons had to come from somewhere. It came from Jesus. Jesus, who was able to be more powerful than even demons, in that He could cast these demons out of people. Mark records in Mark chapter 5, of the time when Jesus and His disciples went across the Sea of Galilee over here to the area of land, that was known as the land of the Gadarenes or the land of the Gergesenes. When Jesus disembarked from the ship there in the land of the Gergesenes, the Bible says that our Lord was met by a man who had an unclean spirit. Now this man lived in the tombs. He had been bound with fetters and chains in the past and simply had broken free of those bonds that had been placed upon him. He was constantly crying out. The Bible says that he was cutting himself with stones. But Mark says this in Mark chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, But when he saw Jesus afar off, the Lord gets off the boat there at the land of the Gergesenes. When this man sees Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee? Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God. It was at this time that Jesus asked this demon that was in this young man, asked the demon his name. And the answer that was given is given in verse 9. The demon said, My name is Legion, for we are many. Jesus then cast the demons out of the man they went into a herd of 2,000 swine that ran down a mountain into the sea and were drowned. So Mark tells of the power of Jesus because that's what the Romans would understand. And Jesus says, or Mark says, that Jesus has got power even over demons. Mark further writes of the lordship of Jesus over sickness and death. In Mark chapter 5, after Jesus and His disciples had left the land of the Gadarenes, they went back across the Sea of Galilee. They land from here back across the sea up near the village of Capernaum. There one of the rulers of the synagogue met Jesus, fell at His feet, and he's got a request to give to Jesus. And that request is found in verse 23 where this ruler of the synagogue tells the Lord, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come, lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Well, while Jesus is going to this man's house in order to heal this man's daughter, the Bible says that he was absolutely thronged by people. One of them was a woman who had had an issue of blood for 12 years. In other words, she had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. She had seen many doctors. She had spent all the money that she had attempting to get this problem resolved. Nobody had been able to help her. When she knew that Jesus was in her town, she forced herself through the mob of people and merely touched the hem of His garment. Mark says that when she touched the hem of the garment of Jesus in Mark 5, 29, and straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Well, after healing this woman, Jesus goes on further towards the home of the ruler of the synagogue whose daughter was so sick that he had pleaded with the Lord to come and heal her. But while they're on their way there, they're met by a certain person who proclaims, Your daughter is dead. Well, even though he heard this, Jesus continued on to the home where the dead girl lay. Jesus told the folks there, The girl's not dead. She's simply asleep. They laughed the Lord to scorn. But Mark says, verses 41 and 42, that he took he, Jesus, 
took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked. So Mark, as he is writing to the Romans, the individuals who understand power and authority, Mark says Jesus is Lord. Not only is He Lord over demons, but Jesus is Lord over sickness, and Jesus is even Lord over death. Mark is the one who records Jesus calming a, st a storm on the Sea of Galilee simply by saying the words, Peace be still. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus is shown as Lord over nature when He actually walks on the water of the Sea of Galilee and enters into the ship where His disciples are located. Well, finally, Jesus is described by Mark as being Lord over salvation. Salvation is something that man has strove for. Salvation is something that man desperately wants. He's got a load of sin upon his back and he wants to get rid of that load of sin. Under the Old Testament, because of the weakness of man, that ridding of the sin that was there was had to be sacrificed yearly, right? But that sacrifice or that load of sin that was on man was a constant reminder that he was weak and erring in the sight of his God. But then Jesus came. When Jesus came, he made it possible for that load of sin to be removed. Not that man would be reminded of it annually, but rather be removed forever. Gone. Mark is the one that records as giving the words of Jesus the means whereby one can have his sins washed away when Mark records these words of Jesus in Mark 16, 16, where he said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, you know the Romans could do a lot of things. But the Romans couldn't cast out demons. And the Romans couldn't heal the sick. And the Romans couldn't raise the dead. And the Romans couldn't forgive sins. But along comes Mark, and Mark, the Gospel writer, talks about this Jesus who has the ability to do all those things and the power that Jesus has in being able to do all these things puts the power of Rome to shame. And that's why Mark wrote about Jesus the way that Mark wrote about Jesus. There you have Jesus. What are you going to do with Him today? Are you going to be like so many and just ignore Him and go out to building just another day? Or are you going to be this, are you going to let this be the day that you permit the power of Jesus to enter into your life? Today if you're here and you're still carrying that burden of sin, today is the day that you can be shed of, that you can get rid of it. Being baptized into Christ, fulfilling the command that the Lord gave. And those sins can be washed away and you can leave this building a new creature. The invitation is yours. It's here subject to it. We invite you to respond. While together we stand. While we sing.